Dear Church, let's talk about preacher burnout with David Deffenbaugh. Hello and welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley. I'm excited to have my friend David Deffenbaugh on the program today. David is actually ministering in my hometown of Paragould, Arkansas. So such a treat for me when I go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas or to visit family, I usually get to have a cup of coffee with David. So I'm excited about that as much as anything. David, thank you for joining us. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. Glad glad to be here. I uh uh, as you were introducing me, I thought, okay, so now I've got burnout attached to my name. So <laughs> some things, some things you don't want to be known for. This, this is one of them. It's kind of a dubious honor, but no, we uh, <laughs> we felt like there's a reason you might be an expert on this. Obviously, um, but I know that there are a lot of preachers that will be watching and tuning in that probably could speak from the heart on this subject as well. Before we jump into that. Tell us a little bit about life, how it's going. This is your second stint at the Center Hill Church of Christ in Paragould. Yes. So talk a little bit yes. about that and about the work there and just kind of how you got there and everything that's going on with you. Okay, okay. Well, um, the, things are going very well for us. Um, Great. I, I look back over the past several years and um, and, and think about where – where I am now, just personally, emotionally, spiritually, and all of those things, and I'm I'm rather amazed at what God has been able to work out uh, to to bring healing uh, into my own life and my own ministry. Um, we we are I'm in a I'm in a non preaching role as a minister for the first time in over 35 years, yeah. and that that's been quite an adjustment. But that has also really provided some some space if i can say it that way for me yeah. uh, to be able to heal and i'm finding it a very fulfilling and very rewarding uh and to, and to be back at center hill again uh, our our first time here we were only here for 2 years uh when we saw an opportunity that we felt like we just really did need to pursue which we did and then um, that that stent did not end like you would prefer to things to end. Yeah. And so um, I believe by the providence of God, there was an opportunity that opened up here in this congregation. They had a need uh, that we were able to come back here. And we were pleased to do so, very pleased to do so. And and they appear to be pleased to have us back. <laughs> I know they I can't are. Can't speak for them, but uh, <laughs> they appear to be pleased to have us back. So, um, uh, this this is this is a, a good place for us to be, and we pray that we it is good for the Center Hill Church for us to be here with them. Yeah, and and you know it's interesting because you know. I, I knew uh, your situation. I knew some of the health concerns that you were having as well associated with just the stress of the of everything. And and Michael Meredith, who is the preacher there at Center Hill, is a good friend of mine. I've known him a long time. He's a friend of our family and everything. And he called me one day. This has been, I guess, two or three years ago. And he said, hey, I've got a wild idea. I want you to tell me if I'm crazy or not. And he was talking about, you know, how they were looking to add an associate minister, you know, somebody who could come in and, and fill that role. And he said, I'm thinking about David. And he said, do you think that could work and all that? And I said, listen, if it could work anywhere, it could work with you two guys because of y'all's personality and everything. And it really has. I mean, you guys yeah. are, are really dynamic together and that's fantastic. And I appreciate it so much. You know, there's not many current preachers in a job that would say, let's bring the old, uh, the old guy back, the guy that used to be the preacher here. Let's bring him back and put him in the uh, position that's like an associate role. And sure, that'll all work out fine, but it did. Well, I tell you what, it, it really does speak volumes about Michael Meredith. Yeah. Uh, he is, he is top notch fella. Yeah. And, uh, um, I, I don't think there's, you can't say this exactly, but there, there doesn't appear to be an ounce of ego in him. Yeah. Um, uh, and so he has proven to be such a, a, a great co-worker here. 
and and we I, I feel like we have meshed exceedingly well. And it, they would invite me back in those intervening years to speak on a summer series. And when I when I came back, Michael he was just always so gracious, yeah. and, and so loving. I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. <laughs> That's going to happen. Get that. But uh, anyway, he he was always so gracious and welcoming and. Uh, I always appreciated that so much. And so when it just so happened, then the last time that I came, things were kind of at, however you want to say it, they were at their peak or they were at their very bottom right. uh, as far as my feelings, my emotions, my, even my spirituality were concerned. And again, man, Michael proved to be just a tremendous uh, encourager and supporter and and, and he he really he spent some time with me while I was here at that time, and this is the incur. If uh, I have a lot had a lot of Barnabases in my life, and we yeah. all have, and, and Michael really proved to be a great Barnabas for me as an encourager at that point. Yeah, and that's awesome because we we hear so often about preachers not being able to work together, not being able to get along, and that's that's such a, an opposite um, you know situation that is it's right. it's heartwarming to know that yeah it's not it's not always negative. Two guys can right. work together and they can make it <laughs> and they can make right. ministry good, you know. Well, and, and, and to be honest, Chris, um, one of the things in my process coming through all of this has been to to have a very bright light shined on my motives yeah. for doing what I'm doing. And, you know, when you're doing something that is good, by definition, it's good. Proclaim the gospel is good. Uh, to be doing something that is receiving the affirmation and even the accolades of your peers and the people you're serving and others who, for whatever reason, are aware of, of what's going on in your life. It, it is so easy to never want to stop or have to stop and and really ask the question, the hard questions, okay, why am I doing this? Yeah. And this, this has really been something that um, has happened in a lot of ways. And one of the ways, I, I remember now why I, why I kind of went down this path, um, but I, I remember talking to a friend who had been at a, been at a sizable congregation um, uh, east of the Mississippi, and he, he left that pulpit and took a youth minister's position. And so I called him and just wanted to talk to him about his experience with that. And one of the things that he said that has proven so true is that he said, David, it will, it will test your humility. Yeah. And I, it, it shocked me uh, in an embarrassing way, the, the number of times where my humility was put to the test be because I was not the pulpit guy. Yeah. I was not the go-to guy anymore. Right. You know, Michael's in that role. And so, okay, why am I having these feelings? Mm -hmm. And they're not pretty. They're ugly. <laughs> right. And, and you hate to see those kinds of, of emotions in yourself, things that you would never want to let others see in you. Precisely, but yeah. It, it did. I mean, it really did test my humility, and uh, I, you know, it, it continues to do so. That yeah. continues to need to be tested in me. Uh, another another way this happened was in considering this particular role. We we were we were leaving Oklahoma City, um, and there were other opportunities for us that were presented to us, um, and two of them were to remain in the pulpit as the pulpit guy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was a part of me that just said, okay, you, you've got, you're, you're a preacher, you're a pulpit preacher. You've, you've got to continue in that role. Um, and this conversation that I, I had with Tanya, my wife, is, uh, you know, I am the son of a preacher. Yes. I come from a preaching family. Yes. My my uncle was a preacher. 
Uh, his whole adult life, he was a preacher, and I was I was right in that mold. That that's you know it was it was a family thing, even you know, and all the other things it was. And so I had I had to ask myself the question, you know, David, are you are you preaching? Is part of why you're preaching to be acceptable to your family? Mm. You know, I I grew up in a family that loved preachers. I I have these great memories uh, as a child growing up in the preacher's home. And they, in in the church where my dad preached in Neosho, um, they invited in some of the, I mean, I, I can't imagine, I can't believe I got to hear these guys preach. Not that I knew to appreciate them at the time, but we, you know, we had in Hugo McCord and Guy in Woods and Wendell Winkler and VP Black and you just go on C. E. McGoy and you just go on and on down that line. Yeah. And there was no doubt in my mind that preachers were revered. Yeah. They were loved, they were admired, they were appreciated. And so uh the it caused me to then coming back to the present, okay, David, why are you doing this? Are you doing this to 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 receive those accolades, to be respected and admired? Are you you know, I ask myself the question, are you doing this so your dad will be proud of you? Ah, yeah. So um the, this whole experience You examined your motives, has, huh? Has forced me to look at my motives and to seriously examine them and, and to question. And, uh, you know, honestly, Chris, I'm not proud of, of what I know at least a part of my motives have been, yeah. um, you know, bringing me up to this point in time in my life. Yeah. Uh, and, and it took, it took some uh, pretty major <laughs> events <laughs> in my life to force that to happen. Yeah. Um, but now, I uh, don't ever want to go through something like that again. But now, um, I'm, I'm glad that it's happened. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're intentionally being vague and speaking in general terms. We never want to shine a bad light on the church or, or, or right. any, you know, throw the church under the bus. But um, I, I, do, I do want to, you know, kind of talk a little bit about um, you know, what led you to this point, like we already have, but also the fact that we talk about burnout and, and sometimes, you know, the, you know, the, the advice is, you know, you just, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you just keep, you keep plugging because ministry's hard and look at Paul and, you know, and he, what he endured and you hadn't endured that much. And, but there, there is a side of this that goes deeper because if it's just about, you know, Hey, the workload's getting too much. And, you know, I, I get tired of preaching every Sunday, you know, that's one thing, but you know, there are some real difficulties and struggles that, that preachers deal with. And, uh, in your case, it was affecting your health. Like, oh, like yeah. I, I, I know you real well. I, 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 uh, I, I preached where your uncle was at in Cassville, Missouri, and we became friends right. because I essentially kind of took his role as he retired, and we were we were dear friends, Wayne and I. Um, your brother is a dear friend of mine, John, and and you know, John told you, you know, this this is this is killing you. You know, you've got to do yeah. something about it. Talk a little bit about the health struggles and and kind of the stress and and maybe your management or mismanagement, if it if that be the case. Of, <laughs> okay. And kind of your mindset of what you were going through during that difficult time in ministry, where you know you were just trying to you're trying to you know keep going and keep plugging. Yeah. Uh, before I, I I get into that, Chris. Um, I, I I thought about something in in thinking about what we were going to be talking about today. Sure. And you know we're talking about preachers for for a very good reason. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what we are, <laughs> and that's that's a mu- that's a great deal of your audience. Yes, preachers. But I know that there are many others who who listen to your podcast um, that that aren't preachers, and that they have tremendous amounts of stress and pressure in their lives. Um, and, and the one, the one that came to my mind first was young mothers. Sure. And the demands on young mothers in motherhood. 
Uh, that's, that's just one example. Then you, you take that a step further to single mothers. Um, I, I sure don't want to convey, and I know it's not your intention to convey in any way, that, that you know, the, the most stressful work in the world is that of a preacher. Absolutely. That, that's not fair. It's not fair yeah. to anybody. But that's our context. Yeah, that's so our podcast. That's where we come yeah. from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, um, <laughs> you know, how to even approach this exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I stepped into a pulpit role that was a desirable position. It was it was in a congregation that had a tremendous reputation and had a good reputation uh, for for good reason. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it had had a long time minister who was very well known, and so you know, as, as you as you think about this, it it, it was it was a uh, it was a coveted pulpit. Yeah, you know, we don't like to speak in those terms. No, I hear you though, but. But, I mean, it's just, it's true. Let's be honest with ourselves. Sure. Uh, and so it was a coveted pulpit position. And so uh, I, I stepped into that. Um, and, uh, you know, I just kept thinking about the tremendous potential that was in this place uh, for this congregation. It had a long and storied history. Uh, it had things in place that the opportunities were just seemingly unbelievable there sure. uh, as to do you know, what could possibly happen here uh, in this place. And so, uh, you know, I stepped into that, that place in that role. I, I did not, uh, two, two errors that I made. Um, and one was to, have too much confidence in my own abilities and my own staying power that I could just by nearly sheer force of will just keep driving and driving and driving to make things happen. Um, I, I did. I, the other mistake I made was not giving sufficient place to the fact that this was a church that had been built by this this effective preacher and it very much by by definition i mean this is just how it is this is not a statement of right or wrong this is just how it is that they very much had taken on the personality of this individual yeah um and it it in so many ways and to such a great extent was what it was because of of him and his work yeah there and that cannot be ignored. I mean, you think about any preacher who is going to be stepping into a pulpit uh, where the the predecessor has been long term and well loved. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that's not that's not an easy thing. I remember uh, running into a, a, a man who is I, I consider him a friend, but he's all he's a long time personal friend of my dad's. A longtime preacher, and so uh, the first time I saw him after stepping into this pulpit position, he referred to me as the sacrificial lamb. Oh wow! So, so you're going to be the sacrifice, <laughs> you know that that's that's going to have to to deal with all of this, and then the next guy that comes in, he'll probably have the better time of it. You want to be the guy uh, after the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I you know, in my dad's own experience, he he came into a pulpit when he went to Neosho, Missouri. Uh, he he followed Wendell Winkler, but oh. he wasn't the first one behind Wendell. Yeah, there was somebody in between. A very good man, a very good preacher. Yeah. Uh, had you know did a lot of good for the kingdom, but he wasn't there very long. Right, um, and that's not anybody's fault. It's just it's a difficult. Thing. And I, I think we've got some men doing some great work in the brotherhood right now in interim ministry. Sure. I mean, that's a very real thing where they will go in and they come in as the interim until uh, the, the, the guy that's going to step in with the intent of being there a long time. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, I, 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 you know, I made mistakes. I made mistakes going in. In that I did not, I didn't do well. 
managing my time. You know, mm-hmm. we talk these these things we talk about so much they're virtually cliche uh, yeah. anymore. Oh yeah, yeah, time management. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, and so I I allowed myself to to just constantly be putting out and giving without ever being, well, I say ever, without being sufficiently refreshed along the way. Yeah. And that just, that just continued on. There were, there were several factors. I, there, there were, um, there were leadership concerns, um, within the congregation there. Uh, those, those proved to be stressful. Yeah. I'll just say that they, they proved to be stressful, uh, sufficient. Sufficiently stressful that it did begin to impact my my health, yeah. uh, and so I did go through a traumatic health experience that involved um, seizure. Um, there was a fall involved where I hit my head, and I ended up with with uh, bilateral subdural hematomas. I had two brain bleeds, yeah. going on. And so, uh, and, and getting past that, getting over that healing from that, you know, it, it was a, it was somewhat of a perfect storm where you had several factors coming together at the same time that just, it, for me personally, it just became a totally unworkable situation Yeah, uh, for me. Yeah. And, and David, Talk a little bit about now that you've had a chance to step back and take a breath, because you you told me over coffee one time that that's really what has been a big benefit to come to uh, Center Hill, to come back to a congregation that you loved and didn't want to leave the first time, but you felt like this opportunity was 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 so was just something you couldn't pass up. But you feel like that this, even though you're you're not preaching on a regular basis like you were before, it gave you a chance to catch your breath and to kind yeah. of step back and reevaluate yeah. life and things. But talk a little bit about now that you you're looking at it from the other side, what ministers can do to hopefully be proactive and, and avoid burnout, at least to the extent that, you know, some of us do where maybe it, causes us to want to leave the ministry and all that. What are some things that we can right, do right. to to be proactive in this? You said you, you didn't give yourself time to refresh and to talk about some of those things that we can do to avoid burnout. Okay. Okay. And, and I mentioned before time management and, and when I say time management, I mean, you be exceedingly um, deliberate and exceedingly proactive in managing your time and in doing that, that you build into that time management, uh, times for you to refresh. Right. Um, and, and, you know, we're all different. So we all do different things. I know you love to fish because I've seen your pictures Absolutely. (laughs) on social media. So whatever it is, whatever it is, and, and you, you don't count that as as just kind of like decorations or um, frivolous part of your schedule. Those are important. Yes, those are exceedingly important times for you to be able to separate yourself from all of the stresses and pressures that are uh, the rest of your schedule. Exactly uh, that that you have that time. I. I have thought a lot about this. Uh, we, we in so many ways are more a reflection of our culture than we are our Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And our culture has made busyness a badge of honor. And, and we like to, for people to look at us and say, well, there, there's a very busy man. Now, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in any way suggesting slothfulness or laziness or anything like that. Right. But it is to the point where if, if our schedules are not filled to the max with all kinds of things, uh, and most of those things are urgent things, 
and there's a difference between urgent and important. Sure. Uh, and, and you've got to learn to distinguish those things that, that we don't feel like we are being um, the kind of people we should be unless we are what we call productive or successful, and that demands that constant busyness. So yeah. that's not very godlike, and that's not very Christ-like. Yeah. I mean, from the very beginning, Exodus or Genesis chapter 2, and on the seventh day, God rested. Yeah. Now, we know he didn't rest because he was tired. Mm-hmm. That's not what that is. But he, he, was, he was busy for seven days, and then on the seventh day, he was not busy. Yeah. It, very interesting, Exodus chapter 31 and verse 17, as that is being described. Um, and this is where in the law, it, it's talking about the Sabbath day. Uh-huh. But it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Oh, yeah. God God showed us from the beginning. And, and, you know, when we make mistakes, it's usually not on the big stuff, it's on the little stuff. Yeah. And, and it's not little stuff, it's basic stuff. And he showed us from the very beginning, okay, this is, this is the rhythm in which God works. Yeah, yeah. Seven, six days rest that that's god's rhythm yeah and we're not very good with those kinds of rhythms we're 24 7 you know and again we kind of see that as a badge of honor i think about the occasions that jesus himself separated himself you've you've got to schedule separation and so mark chapter one uh jesus He's been in in Capernaum, and it's the Sabbath days. He's in the synagogue, and while he's there, he he heals a demon possessed man, and leaves from there to go to Peter's house. And they're in Peter's house, and then Peter's mother in law is sick with a fever, and he heals her. And the sun goes down, and then all of a sudden, all these people show up at Peter's house. Well, it's the pe- people who had been at the synagogue, and they had gone home, and they had talked to friends and neighbors and said, you wouldn't believe what happened today at church. <laughs> this is incredible. And this same guy, he's at Peter's house. And so they all show up. The Sabbath is over yeah. at sundown. So yeah. after sundown, they all show up. And when one of the texts says the whole town showed up. So you can see this huge crowd of people outside, and Jesus is healing, 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 healing. Mm-hmm. And so the next morning, People show up again at Peter's house because there's no end of people who need healing. Right. There's no end. Right. Ever. <laughs> and so Peter wakes up and he sees the crowd. He's looking for Jesus and Jesus isn't there. Yeah. Well, lo and behold, Jesus has gotten up before daylight and gone out to a quiet place to pray. Yeah. And that's where they find him. And so Peter said, Jesus. You've got to get back to the house. These people are there. They're looking for you. They're demanding you. Yeah. And Jesus said, no, not going back to the house. There are other places that, that we need to go, other towns that we need to go to, to preach there also, because that's why I came. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's so much in that, uh, that Jesus, he, he, he took that time. And he was not going to let... Boy, this is a hard one for preachers to learn. Mm -hmm. He did not let the demands of other people. Were those demands legitimate? I mean, they had their sick child there Mm -hmm. wanting Jesus to heal them. They had their mom and dad who, who were ill there. They wanted Jesus to heal him. Yes, those were legitimate demands. But Jesus was not driven by the demands of other people, yeah. even good people, well-meaning people, people who had genuine needs. Again, I'm not suggesting that, that preachers <laughs> be unconcerned for the needs of people. I mean, that's, that's why we do what we, that's what ministry is. Absolutely. But Jesus built it in and he protected that time. 
and his purpose for doing what he was doing. Uh, it happens again uh, after Jesus has, have, has first sent the disciples out. Uh, even gave them the power to cast out demons and they come back and they're all excited about what's going on and what's been happening. And gee, this is this comes at uh, the end of Mark chapter six. And, and but there were so many people crowding around with their demands. They're not just hanging around watching. Right. They want Jesus to do things for them. And so the, the, the demands of the people around them are so great that they they couldn't even eat. Mark says. Mm -hmm. And so he says, okay, let's go apart to a quiet place, a desolate place, separation. And, and it's, it's hard for Jesus. Jesus would not fit well in modern American culture. <laughs> right. He just would not for a lot of reasons. Right. But one of the reasons is he does not buy into the busyness badge of honor. Uh, he, he just doesn't do that. Yeah. So, Preachers have to be exceedingly careful about uh, managing their time and protecting that time away, whatever it is. Um, yeah. I've heard it said uh, a, a preacher needs to divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually. I like it. Uh, I do too. <laughs> you, but you, you have to do that. You have to do that. Uh, so I, I think that that may be one of the most important things. Uh, I think also it becomes incredibly important for the preacher to continue to invest in his family. Yeah. And, and, and family takes time. Being a husband takes time. Being a parent takes time. And there have been far too many preachers who, in the name of being a preacher, mm -hmm. it sounds a little, little harsh, mm -hmm. but uh, they have offered their family as a sacrifice on the altar of ministry. Yeah, I agree. I, I and I really don't think that pleases God. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I was I was a husband before I was a preacher, mm -hmm. and I had every intention before I ever became a preacher to be a dad. Yeah, and that that takes our time, and so we have to invest in that. And I'll tell you why uh, that that is so well. It's important because that's just how it is. That's mm -hmm. the reality and the truth of it. But you find yourself in a position, as I found myself. And I was I was stripped down to the bare bones, emotionally, yeah, spiritually, psychologically. I, I was I was it was it I was, and so what I what I had in that moment, yeah, is I had my wife, right, and I told her I have told her many times. Since then, Tanya, you saved my life. Yeah. Uh, and you you find yourself in a position where you are absolutely relying on other people. I mean, you, you just you just you just can't make it through that day without these people. Yeah. And so that's why the investment in them repeatedly and continually as you go through these things. Um, is so very important. Number one, they they have to have it. Yeah, they have to have. They have to be your priority. Uh, and so, the the time spent. I re <laughs> I remember when our daughter, our oldest, was in high school and she was running track, and she came to me one day and she said you know, dad, you haven't been to a track meet yet. To mm. Watch me run. Yeah. I mean, she called me out <laughs> and I needed called out. Yeah. And I guarantee you, I, I did not miss another one. Yeah. I, Chris, I, I've watched you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I know when, um, your son was, when Zane was, was playing soccer and, 
I, I got the feeling that you were you were at every match that yeah. you possibly could be. And I also know that you adjusted your schedule, your personal schedule, to allow that to happen. Yeah. Uh, you did some things there to make that happen. And and I think that's exactly the thing that's got to happen. Yeah. Um, you, you've, you've got to make those investments. You You have to find people who are your confidants Mm -hmm. i mean we have we have friends i heard it described this way we all have friends but we need what this man called a capital f friend yeah and and this is someone who who knows you quite well with with whom you have been very open and honest and they know you warts and all (laughs) They know the weaknesses, they know your tendencies, and they they can shoot straight with you and will straight sh- straight shoot straight with you when when the situation calls for that. And you need those people. I agree. You you need those people. And that may be friend and those those capital F friends. One of my capital F friends is my brother. Uh-huh. Um and you, you find yourself in a situation where you have to be able to rely on them and their judgment and their recommendations. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to do everything that someone suggests to you, no matter how close they are to you. But uh, again, in my situation, I was at the point of having to make a, a decision about, okay, what's, what's my next move? And so uh, Tanya and I had had that conversation many times. Mm -hmm. I knew very well what her thought was about that. Yeah. And uh, we happened to be back home. I still call Neosho home because that's where both of us were were reared there. That's where my mom and dad still live and my brother and his family, his wife and my younger sister and, and her husband. So anyhow, we, we were back home and we were sitting at mom and dad's and it happened that my brother and his wife were there as well. And we were just kind of in the throes of all of this. Yeah. I had these choices to make. Okay. What's coming next? Chris, I, I didn't trust my own judgment. Yeah. I, I just didn't. And that's an, another thing that I learned in coming through what I came through was that I was not nearly as smart as I thought I was Mm -hmm. because there were some things that I felt like needed to happen in the church where I was in order for this church to move forward. And what, what I I noticed was that many of the very things that I thought should happen or needed to happen happened. Yeah. And it, it, it did not improve. It did not get better. And in some instances, it got much worse. Yeah. And I said, David, you're an idiot. <laughs> you don't know anything. <laughs> um, so I was sitting there with the family. I asked them, because my family is not forthcoming with advice. <laughs> uh, Sounds like satire just, to me. That, that, no, that is not satire. That is a statement of honest truth. They, to a fault, I appreciate my parents about this. They don't get in your business. Yeah, that is good. They just don't. Yeah. They stay out. That's your family. That's your life. That's your decision to make. And unless you ask them directly, they're not going to give it to you. So yeah. I wanted to know, what do you think we should do? Yeah. And I actually started with the women first. Mm-hmm. I asked my mother. I asked my sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. And I, I did that purposefully because I wanted to be sure. I, th- they have their own minds, and I know they have their own minds. But I did not want their suggestions to me to even have the hint of what what my brother and my dad said. So yeah. I asked the women first. And yeah. then I asked my brother. And then I asked my dad and every one of them said the same thing, which was exactly what Tanya had been telling me. Yeah. And it 
honestly, Chris, was not the thing that I thought I wanted to do at that time. Mm-hmm. There was another option out there that I thought, but I said, David. <laughs> Listen to your, your, your people. Listen to them. Mm-hmm. And so my point that in all of that is find those kind of people in your life that, that know you, that you've been open enough with, um, and that can they can shoot very straight with you because they're seeing it from the outside and they see things that you don't see. Yeah. You're blinded, you're clouded by a lot of different things. So yeah. I, I think those those become very important things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in, in dealing with with the ongoing stress of and pressures of, of being a preacher. Yeah. Very well stated. And you know, I, I'm certainly not an expert at this either. But one of the things that well, two things that I've always tried to do, I've realized early on in coaching or in ministry, they're both kind of the same in that people will use you as much as you make yourself available to them, you know, and so uh, and that's not that's not a knock on people. Uh, people need you and um, and you need them. Um, but there has to be some boundaries. You have to kind of build some, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, I wouldn't say a cage, that sounds pretty bad, but uh, you do have to draw out and mark off some boundaries. And uh, probably the most important word in a preacher's vocabulary is no. Um, and then, you know, yes. another thing that I've always done is Saturday's our day. That's my day. That's my day with the family. Saturday is that day. Now, the church here, uh, you know, they, they're very generous with giving me time off. But, you know, Friday, I'm not in the office if I can help it. But, mm-hmm. you know, you got... You, you've always got other things to catch up on, but Saturday is my day. If there's not a funeral or a wedding or something extenuating, Saturday has always been my day. And, and you know, I kind of laugh. I talked to a preacher friend of mine one time many years ago, and I said, so, you know, what's your day off? You know, oh, I don't get a day off. And I thought, well, I do. And I take Saturday, and I may lay around and watch football all day. But I don't think yeah. about church. I don't get into that. Um, I've made some folks mad over the years uh, when they've said, sure. you know, hey, can you do this on Saturday? Uh-uh, I can't. Um, and I, I think that's been important for my, um, you know, kind of sanity. But you made some really, really good points there that I think are, are just exceptional. And I want to close like this, though. I, I want to close with you. So you're, you're speaking to someone that's considering leaving ministry because of the burnout. What do you tell them? What advice do you give? Well, number one, don't make that decision in the heat of the moment. Yeah. Dale Jenkins uh, says don't quit on a Monday. So <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Don't, don't do that in the heat of the moment. Um, give yourself some time. Um, and not, not just, yeah, give yourself some time. Step away as much as you can get some separation there um talk hopefully you have these kind of people in place already talk to people who aren't going to just say what they think you want them to say yeah. uh, but who are going to shoot straight with you um uh, i i was i very seriously contemplated leaving ministry uh and and i even Look, started investigating some alternative things to be doing. Yeah, I um, spoke with a, a, a preacher who encouraged me so very strongly, uh, and well, it, it was it was Michael <laughs> here right. at Center Hill when I'd come to preach the, during that summer series, and we had long conversation about that. And I got back home and I got this long text from Michael and he was laying out the case for my not leaving ministry. Yeah. And I'm not going to say I necessarily appreciated it at the time. Right. But I do now. Sure. Uh, very much so. Uh, so you, you, you want to, you want to consider some things. Uh, like like what ended up happening for me, and again, my situation is not you know a blueprint for anybody else's situation at all. But uh, what became true for me was stepping into a different kind of ministry role. Yeah, and uh, very surprisingly to me, it has allowed some other aspects of 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 my work 
to flourish that had never been able to before because of the demands of at least two sermons in one class, oftentimes two classes uh, a week, plus everything else. There just was not physically time to do these other things. Well, now stepping into a role where I'm not preparing two sermons a week, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, teaching Bible class, for me, has just gone to an, a whole new level, yeah. uh, just for me personally, yeah. what I feel like I can do with that. And, and hopefully what has become beneficial to those who are a part of that class. But just consider that. Consider there are other opportunities of ministry uh, to think about here. Yeah. Uh, um, so I think that's, that's what I have yeah. to offer that, right there. That's good. Um, you know, I, I, I tell folks sometimes, you know, when, when, we, when we discuss it, remember, remember who you're doing this for, you know. It's not the members. It's not the elders. Ultimately, your boss is God. This is the reason you're doing it. The reason you got into it, hopefully, was because you love God. You you feel like he gave you this talent and ability. And, and don't squash that simply because of a bad experience, even though that bad experience could be horrendous. It could be even catastrophic to your faith, you know, but at the end of the day, remember who you do it for. Um, right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're back to motivation again. Exactly. There. You're back to your heart. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so sometimes I think the 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 stress and the burnout that we're feeling is due to what we perceive to be uh, expectations that are not being fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. whose expectations are those? Right. Right. Yeah. David, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been absolutely uh, incredible, and I I hope that the people that are tuning in. Um, if they're not a preacher, that this maybe transcends over into other areas of life and other occupations. I think there's a lot to be said there for other, you know, uh, vocations in life as well. So thank yeah, you for that, yeah, David. I hope so. Well, thank you for inviting me, Chris. Absolutely. I, I have appreciated the opportunity to visit with you. Absolutely. And uh, I want to tell our viewers and listeners that if you have a question about today's episode, you can contact me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. If you have a specific question for for David. We'll make sure that he gets it. Send it to me. I'll send it on to him, and I'm sure he'd be glad to, to offer any kind of, uh, you know, counsel or anything. If you're if you're needing help, if you're a preacher that's watching this and you feel like you're on that precipice of burnout and you're ready to leave the ministry or you're just struggling a little bit and you need some encouragement, let us know. We want to help you in any way that we can. We're here for you. And once again, thank you for tuning in. David, thank you, my friend. We'll keep in touch. I'll see you in Paragould sometime. We'll have some coffee. All right. Let's go do it. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Thank all of you for tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you sincerely, Chris.